Good morning. Good morning. We're going to be in chapter nine. Chapter nine. Chapter nine is where we're starting off this morning. And praise be to God. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. And we're talking about generosity. So what a good day to talk about uh, generosity on a Sunday where most people tend to worship, whether you're worshiping in person and social distancing or whether you're worshiping on over the, uh, you know, uh, social media, the YouTube or, you know, Facebook videos or even uh, on Google Duo or Zoom. There's a lot of different ways to worship and to still be in the presence of the Lord. And so we're talking about generosity out of John C. Maxwell, the 21 indispensable qualities of a leader, becoming the person others want to follow. And so you can lose nothing when you worship with Christ. You have everything. You gain everything when you're worshiping with Christ and, and when you're giving generosity, giving and being generous. And so, uh, he says here, your candle loses nothing when it lights another. So we ought to let our light shine for others to light others with our light. And so I, the question is, is, are you lighting your, are you allowing your light shine through you to light others? And so Calvin Coolidge of American president says no person was ever honored for what he received. Honor has been the reward for what he gave. And then John C. Maxwell says, given is the highest level of living. And for, before we get started in fleshing it out, uh, I just want to say that this is coming from again, John C. Maxwell, the 21 indispensable qualities of a leader becoming the person others want to follow. Also, there is no monetary Receive for this, uh, this video here is just a matter of teaching, of uh, out of one of the uh, books that he has written and just wanting to share information to help people be better than who they are. And whoever is interested that stops by to listen, may you take something with you or share it with someone else or with others. So on today, we're going to be talking about fleshing it out in generosity. And it says right here, Nothing speaks to others more loudly or serves them better than generosity from a leader. True generosity isn't an occasion event. It comes from the heart and permeates every aspect of a leader's life, touching his time, money, talents, and possessions. Effective leaders, the kind that people want to follow, don't gather things just for themselves. They do it in order to give to others. And that's, that's important, being generous. So when you, you, you are, you are an effective leader, you know, you're going to, to give to others. Whatever you gather, you do it to help others. You do it so that others can be fulfilled and you can see, you know, the smiles on their faces and the joy come through and their light shining because you have allowed your light to shine in you to shine down on others. And so effective leaders, they, they, they help other people because they're constantly giving of themselves. And in order to, to be an effective leader, you have to learn how to give and be generous. And then it says, uh, cultivate the quality of generosity in your life. So if you're not being generous, Come on and grab a hold of it and, and cultivate that quality. Work on that quality. If you're, if you haven't been generous or you feel like you've been missing out or you've been shortchanged and giving to others and you haven't given like you should or you feel like you're struggling in that aspect, then God can help you with that through prayer that he will guide your heart and, and soften your heart to be generous to others. And then number one, it says, be grateful for whatever you have. Be grateful for whatever you have. It's hard for a person to be generous when they're not satisfied with what they have. So if you're not satisfied in your own life, then nine times out of 10, you will not be able to give and be generous to others. And then generosity comes out of contentment comes out of contentment. And that doesn't come with acquiring more. So sometimes people think that the more they get, they're going to be content. But a lot of times people that have a lot of stuff are still not content. As a matter of fact, there seem to be far worse off and unhappy than others that don't have but a little. So when you think about uh, going out and buying more stuff, that really does not make you 
more happy what it does is make you have more stuff that you have to go through that you have to cover maybe with your insurance policy to keep from uh you know theft or if there was a disaster the more you lose with the more that you have so if you're able to be generous and to give to others that comes from being content and millionaire john d rockefeller admitted i have made millions but they have brought me no happiness and most people that have money are not always happy and that's a myth to say that the more money i have i can be happy money doesn't buy happiness you know only god can give you joy and that joy is something that cannot be taken from you the world didn't give it and the world cannot take it away and if you're not content with little you won't be content with a lot so you got to be able to be content with the things that you already have and if you feel like you have a little and you're happy and you're excited and you're helping others and you're glorifying christ and you're worshiping him that's good news my brothers and sisters but and if you're not generous with little, you won't suddenly change if you become wealthy. See, attitude has a lot to do with being generous to other people. And then number two, put people first. The measure of a leader is not the number of people who serve him, but the number of people he serves. The measure of a leader is not the number of people who serve him, but the number of people he serves. And generosity requires putting others first, putting others first. And that's true. Being generous, you're going to put others first. And if you can do that, giving becomes much easier. The more you put others first, the more your generosity becomes easier and the more your light shines through and shines upon others. And number three, don't allow the desire for possessions to control you. And we see that a lot today that people get things and they start to allow their possessions to control them. And you've heard sometimes people say, before you had money, you was, you was nice, you were sweet, you know, and, and uh, I could talk to you. Now that you got money, you think you're better than others. You, nobody can talk to you. You're not approachable. Nobody sees you. And it's always about your possessions. Don't allow possessions to control you. And according to uh, John, uh, Mr. Maxwell says, according to my friend Earl Wilson, people can be divided into three groups. And there's three groups, the haves, the haves not, and the ones that have not paid for what they have. And those are the ones that are in debt, carrying this heavy burden of debt. So again, three groups, the haves, the have nots, and they have not paid for what they have. And sometimes they have not paid for what they have or trying to keep up with, you know, the saying, the Joneses. And this is not, no offense to anyone with the last name Jones, but you, you've heard that before, trying to keep up with the Joneses. And so they go and accumulate debt, even though they can't afford it, but they accumulate it to have things that they really cannot truly afford. And once they become in debt, some people have to file bankruptcy or some people, they struggle to make ends meet and to pay all these, these creditors because they want to have things that they cannot afford. So again, have not paid for what they have. And they're out here flossing around with all this debt and, and bragging, but yet and still, if you don't pay your bills, certain things can can be taken from you, such as a car. Uh, your home could go in foreclosure and creditors can come after you and you can be stressed out and not wanting to answer the phone. So so if that's you, I pray for you and I, I pray that God will lead you uh, to a better place in your life to not allow desire for possessions to control you. And some of us have already been there and we've made a way and we've prayed and asked God to deliver us. And we've took care of our responsibilities. And you, start, and you see some advertising where people say they've paid off debt in this year and that year and how many years. And that's good news if people are really doing those things. So don't allow the desire for possessions to control you. Uh, more and more people are becoming enslaved to the desire to acquire. And that's the thing about becoming enslaved to the master of the world or to your employer, you know, becoming enslaved. 
And, and that's what the, what the devil wants is for you to be enslaved instead of for you to be walking in freedom in Jesus Christ and knowing that God's going to take care of all of your basic needs so you don't have to go out and acquire more stuff because he's going to bless you with the things that he believes and desires if it's in line with his will on what you should have. And he's going to provide for you so you don't have to go running and become enslaved to the master of the world. And then owning things is an obsession. And this, excuse me, Arthur Richard Foster writes, owning things is an obsession in our culture. You see what the culture is today, right? And if we own it, we feel we can control it. And if we can control it, we feel it will give us more pleasure. Hmm. He says that idea is an illusion. If you want to be in charge of your heart, don't allow possessions to take charge of you. Because most of the time, what's in someone's heart comes out in either verbal or actions or behaviors. And so number four, regard money as a resource. Someone once said that when it comes to money, you can't win. If you focus on making it, you're materialistic. If you try to but don't make any, you're a loser. If you make a lot and keep it, you are a miser. If you make it and spend it, you are a spendthrift. If you don't care about making any, you're unambitious. If you make a lot and still have it when you die, you're a fool for trying to take it with you. The only way to really win with money is to hold it loosely and be generous with it to accomplish things of value. As E. Stanley Jones said, money is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. See, God knows that we need money to live. He knows that we need money to pay bills. He knows, but how you utilize that money. And if you're buying other stuff and not paying your bills first, then you're mismanaging the money that God has already given you. You're mismanaging money that God has blessed you with because he only requires this 10%. And if you work in and he's provided a job for you, no one can do it without Christ, no matter what you believe in. But I still believe that Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And regardless of what you believe, God is waking you up every morning. You don't wake up on your own. God is doing it. And so if you have a job, he's blessed you with that. And if you go back and think about it, God wanted the good. If he went, when he went back and you look at Genesis chapter one, even from the beginning, he wanted the good for us and he established everything for us. And we know the story, most of us, that the fall came. And now you're, you're working at the sweat of your brow and becoming enslaved and culture, this culture that we live in. That's why we're not to act the ways of the world. We live in the world, but not to be acting and behaving as the world does, but to act and beha behave more like Christ and what his wor word causes us to. And so, uh, he goes on to say, as E. Stanley Jones, he goes on to say, if it gets on top and you get under it, you will become its slave. You don't want money on top of you. And you have to keep on fighting your way and digging your way out and pushing it aside to get up off of your back. It, you don't want to be up under money. You just don't want to be up under money. Because money if it's that much, it can become heavy and weigh you down and, and burden you. And number five, develop the habit of giving. In, in 1889, millionaire industrialist Andrew Carnegie wrote an essay called Gospel of Wealth. In it, he said that the life of a wealthy person should have two periods, a time of acquiring wealth and one of redistributing it. The only way to maintain an attitude of generosity is to make it your habit to give. Your attention, excuse me, your time, your attention, your money, and resources. Richard Foster advises just the very act of letting go of money or some other treasure does something within us. It destroys the demon greed. Hmm. If you're enslaved by greed, you cannot lead. And let me say this again. If you're enslaved by greed, you can not lead. And that's part of this 
what Richard Foster is advising. And so we have to make sure we're not enslaved by greed, because if we're enslaved by greed, you will not be an effective leader. You will not be able to effectively lead if you are enslaved by greed, because you will be selfish and you will not be able to be generous to others because you will always be trying to capture what you believe that you should have. And it will take away from you being generous and kind and putting on charity for others. And let's reflect on it. Are you a generous leader? See, these are always some questions that you can ask yourself as we go through this series of these chapters in this book. Are you a generous leader? Do you continually look for ways to add value to others? Are you giving money to something greater than yourself? And to whom are you giving your time? Are you pouring your life into others? Are you helping those who cannot help you or give you anything in return? And, and I want to add to that. Are you placing conditions on your giving? Because see, sometimes people place conditions on their giving. I will help you if I will give you this. If I will do this, if I will, I will go with you. But you know, there's conditions placed on the giving and see God doesn't place conditions on his giving for us. And I seen it, it seems in the, uh, the, you know, the political realm we had, you know, it seems that, that, that there was some conditions placed on, uh, on us giving. And, and the giving was, if you vote for me, I'll give. And, and, and I think that's a bad way to, to try to help people because e either you are generous or you're not. Either you have kindness and charity in your heart and love to help people in need or you don't. And so we should not, I don't believe we should place conditions on our giving. And if you're able to give, and you're giving without a loan and, and, and all of that, you're just giving because God placed it on your heart. And that's your purpose is to help others and to be charitable, put on charity and be charitable and help and be generous. Then there shouldn't be any conditions placed on that. And so writer John Bunyan affirmed, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. See how many times and you can ask yourself this. How many times have you done for others and they couldn't repay you? But you were excited doing it and you knew they could never give you anything in return. They couldn't repay you. But you gave up your time generously and you're still excited about it. And you don't regret it. And you're not angry about it. You're not talking about it. You were able to do it because God placed it on your heart. But if you did it and you're complaining about it, then it wasn't God's will. It wasn't within God's will, excuse me. And let's remind ourselves that God loves a cheerful giver. And if you're not cheerfully given, God doesn't want that. He doesn't want that type of heart or that type of attitude. He wants someone that's going to be a cheerful giver, that's giving cheerfully, being generous, and being led by the Holy Spirit. So if you aren't given in the small areas of your life, you're probably not as generous a leader as you could be. Now let's bring it home. John Baxell gives us some things, three things to improve our generosity. Number one, give something away. Find out what kind of hold your possessions have on you. That's very interesting because how many times have we wanted to give things away and we start going through stuff and putting it in a bag or putting it in the giveaway pile. And a lot of people can, and can relate to this, putting it in a giveaway pile. And then you go back to the giveaway pile and that pile was high. And as you start to put things in a bag, in this big garbage bag, as we usually use, a good, thick, thick, strong garbage bag, maybe a garbage bag that you use to rake up yard waste because those are pretty stronger than just regular trash bags and so are garbage bags. And so when you get done with this big, huge pile and you start putting it in the bag, you how much winds back up in the not giveaway pile, in the pile that you don't 
want to give away after all. So give something away. And that's why it says it will find out what kind of hold your possessions have on you. Because if you put everything that you say you're going to give away in the giveaway pile, and then by the time you start putting it in the bag, the pile that you the pal that you have over to the side that you were going to keep is now back up to almost the size of the pal that you had it in the giveaway pal. So take something you truly value. Value. Think of someone you care about who can be, who could benefit from it and give it to him. And if you could do if you can do it anonymously, even better. That would be even better to do it anonymously. To do it anonymously, that would be even better. And then put your money to work. Put your money to work. If you know someone with the vision to do something really great, something that will positively impact the lives of others, provide resources for him to accomplish it. Put your money to work for something that will outlive you. Something that you're going to leave a legacy. Something that will leave a legacy that you're doing good for others and towards others. And number three, find someone to mentor. That's so important. Even if you don't have the resources or the money, but you have the time and the knowledge. And you have some tools to share with others that may not be able to buy books. They may not be able to afford every book that comes on the market. That's going to teach us to be better than who we are. Some people don't even have a Bible. And so when I go out sometime, I buy Bibles, you know, even if it's from Dollar Tree, buying a Bible to give to someone that may not have it, or even the homeless have a few Bibles that you keep in your car, in your trunk to give out, or even a couple of backpacks that have necessary basic, uh, you know, supplies and, and food in there, like granola bars and, and maybe a bottle or two or some water, you know, that you can provide to the homeless when you're driving around town and you're going about your business or even going back and forth to work and you see the homeless and you stop and hand them a backpack and tell them that you just wanted to bless someone and you wanted to help them and give them something to need. And those are things that have no strings attached. But even just getting back to mentoring someone, how can you help others? How can you help young people and, and, you know, and talk to them when you see that there is a need? So once you reach a certain level in your leadership, the most valuable thing you have to give is yourself. Find someone to pour your life into, then give him time and resources to become a better leader. And then our daily takeaway is when popular French author Dominique Lapierre or LaPierre, LaPierre, excuse me, LaPierre, first traveled to India to do research for a new book. He went in style. In a Rolls Royce silver shadow, he had just purchased with a book advance. Hmm. While he was there, he got what he needed for his book, The City of Joy. Excuse me. But he also received something else, a passion to help the poor and miserable people he discovered there. That discovery has changed his life forever. Now he divides his time between writing, fundraising, and donating time and money to help the people. His attitude can be summed up by the words of Indian poet Rambendranath Tagore, which are printed on the back of LaPierre's business card. All that is, all that is not given is lost. What are you currently losing by holding on to it? So if you're holding on to things that you can give, that you can give away, it becomes lost because you're not using it to help others. And that's the important thing. And, and the question is too, that I'm going to ask, I'm going to put that in there. What are you doing with the blessings that God has already given you? Are you utilizing those blessings to help others? Or are you saving it up for a rainy day? Are you storing it up because of greed? 
Are you storing it up because you haven't figured out how to be generous? What are you doing with the blessings of generosity that God has already given you? And if you are not generous, are you praying that God would do a mighty work in you and, and move your heart to a place of generosity? I thank you on today for tuning in and listening, for viewing my video. Like, subscribe, and share the video. Because even if you don't need it, there's somebody out there that needs to hear a word and needs to hear a video. There are so many people that have needs. And so I pray on today that you will be blessed and may the Holy Spirit lead you and continue to move in your hearts to help others to be kind and to spread love, joy throughout the land. God bless you all. Peace on today.